Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar. I was just making sure that I was off mute and you can all hear me. Um, this webinar is all about uh, Request to Pay, uh, the journey that, that we've been on and, um, and what's, what's ahead of us on the horizon. My name is Mahail Damashki. I'm the Chief Payments Officer here at, at, at Pay.UK. And I'm joined by my colleagues, um, Simon Brooks and Mark Jones, uh, who have, have been leading our Request to Pay um, proposition. Um, so I'm delighted to also welcome our industry panel. Um, I'll start with uh, Sean Williams, Director of Policy and Innovation at Toynbee Hall and a member of Pay.UK's uh, User Advisory Council. Welcome, Sean. Uh, we also have James Stanley, who was Collections Campaign Strategy Manager at Angling Water. Welcome to you, James. And to confuse me and make it easier for all of you, we also have James McQuarrow, from Bank of America, where um, James works with non-bank financial institutions um, and API product management. So uh, welcome, James, um, as well. Um, and we, we have uh, two representatives, actually, who have tested uh, their first live transaction request to pay um, uh, and, and have been accredited uh, as infrastructure providers or, or um, certified repository providers. Um, so we have Peter Cornforth from AnswerPay, um, who was the commercial director there. Welcome, Peter. Um, and Ben Williams, uh, who is the request to pay lead from MasterCard. So uh, welcome, welcome, Ben. We'll hear from um, our panelists um, very shortly. Uh, we'll be allowing about 45 minutes uh, for you to hear from, from our speakers. Um, and hopefully we'll finish up with 15 minutes, um, in, you know, to, to allow for question and answer. So, um, and, and we, we hope to finish right on time, but we, you know, we want to respect your time and, and um, I know you're, you're all very busy and, and we appreciate you joining us today. So um, just a few housekeeping, um, it's probably things that you already know. Um, you'll be able to see our speakers. Um, all attendees will be muted during the call um, and we won't be able to see um, who is attending and, and none of our, our speakers will be able to see who's attending. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can do so at any time throughout the presentation. Um, and that's by uh, uh, clicking on, the, the, there is a Q&A function, um, as you all know, with Zoom located near the bottom of the screen. Um, but you can also send a question uh, to um, events at wearepay.uk. So you can email us the question if you'd like to um, as well. And again, um, no one can see uh, your questions. Um, so, uh, so please feel free to do that as we go. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please use that same email address that I've just given you, which is events at wearepay.uk. Um, now today's session is being recorded um, and we may, it may be shared internally and published externally by pay.uk. Um, only the speakers will be recorded and um, there'll be no details of attendees shared at, at, at any point and none of that will be visible. And finally, we're hoping that, uh, you know, as a result of today, we're going to uh, start spark a conversation uh, between all of you. So ordinarily in a face to face environment, you would be exchanging business cards and so on. Um, we will be uh, looking at an opportunity for you to do that digitally, um, but, but I'll give you more information at the end of the webinar. So for now, let me hand over to our team, um, Simon Brooks and Mark Jones to get us started. Simon, thank you. Thanks, Maha. Uh, my name is Simon Brooks. Some of you will be very familiar with me as I've probably spoken to you over the course of uh, this journey with regard to RTP. Um, I am the business owner for um, Request to Pay uh, and have been responsible along with a lot of colleagues within Pay.UK um, for the delivery of uh, Request to Pay. Uh, and my colleague, Mark Jones, will just give you a brief um, introduction about himself before we start a, a short presentation. So yeah, good, 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 good morning, my name is Mark Jones. Uh, I'm the project manager for Request to Pay um, and uh, previous background has been working for the, uh, the, the main banks, uh, one of the big banks in particular for about 17 years, I think it was uh, before I uh, became involved with this. So uh, good morning to you, I'll hand back to Simon. Thanks, Mark. Um, so um, we are going to take you, as I said, on a, on a whistle stop tour of uh, Request to Pay, um, the journey so far and also what's what's going to be coming next so what's coming down the track um so 
um, briefly, we we have the journey so far. So it says it started there in, in 2017. For me, it started back in 2015 when I was working for Faster Payments. Um, so it's been quite a long journey. Um, I'm not sure I like the word journey, but that's the one we're using. Um, as you can see from that time, time graph, um, it started to pick up um, in 2017. Um, and we worked closely with the Payment Strategy Forum um, and um, Sean is, is well aware of the work that we did with that group. Um, we created a blueprint with the, with the strategy forum and the PSR, and um, then we moved into Pay.UK, um, who then started to develop the process. Initially, um, we were looking at a, a, just a, a purely payment structure, but it was quickly determined as we went through this process that actually request to pay would be better as a messaging service and to that end request to pay has become a, is a messaging service which is actually payment agnostic so that's really important to understand that it's a messaging service so we have the capability as we go forward to develop it further uh, and create um, a lot more messages and hopefully at the end of this presentation we'll be able to tell you about a few of those projects that we've got ongoing now so as you can see it's been quite a long journey and and a huge success um, in in 2020 the 29th of may we managed to to launch the rtp framework um, which which was a great and a huge success for for us in pay.uk uh, and now that actually that was the the easy bit i guess that the hard work now begins to to start to bring on organizations and as um, Maha has rightly said we have the first two joining us on this call um, but obviously to make this this work we need a lot more organizations to join um, and hence this webinar has been created to bring you together and as Maha said if we could have been doing this face to face we would have been able to have a, a session at the end of it where you could have exchanged business cards and, and those organizations that are creating the, the request to pay propositions could have spoken you to, to you directly however we know that's not possible because of the circumstances that we're in today so hopefully this web webinar will be an introduction into how that um, how you can engage in request to pay and speak to organizations that are developing propositions so um, as i say fine the final bit of the journey was to to release the framework documentation on the 29th of may um, it's very important that we we understand um, and could i have the next slide please that we understand that request to pay is not um, a replacement for direct debit um, at the beginning of the journey it was it was felt and i heard a lot of conversations suggesting that direct uh, that the request to pay would be replacing direct debit there are over four billion direct debit payments made every year and request to pay is not a replacement for it however during the course of the the process that we've gone through we have undertaken research along this journey um, to establish why whether request to pay is a viable proposition um, and just to give you some indication of why I think um, that it is, we've got some figures there that, that demonstrate that actually request to play will play an important part in people's lives as we go forward. So the big one that I'm just going to pick up on here is that 45% actually say is in relation to utility bills. And what it's saying is that 55% of uh, utility bills are paid by direct debit, which actually means 45 percent aren't so there is a massive market there um, for us to tap into with request to pay and because request to pay allows people to have that flexibility and that control it gives them a better option and another piece of information that we've discovered through our research um, for request to pay is that a lot of millennials are now suggesting that um, they don't like direct direct debits um, because it doesn't give them the flexibility and the control and they don't like the fact of a, a payment being able to come in and take the money out of their accounts without their control. So there's a lot of data there that suggests that there is a place for request to pay um, and hopefully through this journey today we'll be able to show um, reasons why you should start considering um, having a request to pay proposition in your organisations. I'll now hand over to Mark, who's going to talk us through um, the request to pay ecosystem. Yeah, hi. So I won't go into this in massive detail, given the amount of time that we've got, but uh, and hopefully some of you will have seen this slide before. But um, 
what I would like to just draw out is um, that the role of Pay.UK in all of this has been to define the standards and rules uh, around the framework uh, and to publish that. Um, and uh, hopefully people will uh, take up the, the, the framework and build it into their propositions to be able to deliver re request to pay as part of their services. And, and so what does that mean? Well, th there's the repository layer and there's the user front end. And you should think of these very similar to email in that the repositories are, are, are basically the data stores where, where, where the um, messages are stored. Um, and then the front end is the means of accessing those messages in much the same way that you access your email on your mobile phone or, or, or through a, a web browser, etc. Uh, and and the, the great thing about all of this is that it's been defined using um, web standards, uh, open APIs, etc. to uh, allow people to easily build into their propositions and offerings um, this, 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 this uh, service. Um, and so, so that's, that, that's the way it's delivered to the end user. Um, I think another thing to, to draw out as well is that um, the, the end user was very much um, front of mind as we were going through developing these standards. Um, and, and one of the useful things that were built in is the pre-authorization message which is a message that has to be sent when a biller is setting up the relationship with, the, with their customer, the end user. Um, and uh, the end user has to respond to that before any request can be sent through. And this allows both parties to be certain that they are talking to the right people, um, but also provides that reassurance to the end user that, um, you know, that they are in control of who is sending the messages, et cetera, as well. So um, hopefully this, 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 that, that will make it uh, appealing to people. Um, and if you would like to know more about that there, then we can go into more detail uh, or, or you can use uh, our websites to see the, uh, the, the um, specifications that are on there. Simon, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So um, we've got some big news to announce today um, and as you can see from the slide that I have in front of me we will be introducing um, the request to pay mark. So very exciting news today. This is the first time that many of you or any of you apart from those um, who work in pay.uk will have seen this. So please become aware of this mark. This is the new request to pay mark. So I'm quite I'm really excited for, for this because this has been a massive journey for me and it's it's really exciting to see we now have a mark for request to pay so it brings it to life for me so it's really fantastic we have done a load of research in in establishing this mark to determine you know with with consumers with businesses so we've developed it in consultation with a, with a number of organizations um, and quite a few focus groups along the way so it's not just a, a pay.uk proposition it's been it's been tested and i'm really pleased with it i like it a lot i think it it does what we want it to do which is says you know a request to pay needs to have action it's a message um, and there's a bill behind it so i'm really pleased with it so um, i'm happy to to display it to you for the first time today and i hope you all join me in in um thinking it's a really good um uh, mark for the for the proposition uh, okay. now back to mark so uh, we mentioned earlier on that uh, as well as defining the um, the initial set of APIs for, for, for the framework uh, at launch, uh, we were also thinking of uh, ways that we can evolve the um, service going forward, the framework going forward. Uh, we'd just like to take you through now um, some, of the, uh, some, of the, some of the things on our list basically that we're working around and thinking through at the moment, uh, which we'll be looking to uh, introduce in, in the future. So uh, we'll start off uh, with Simon, if you want to just take us through Ian. Yep, so Ian is an interactive advanced notification. This is something we've been working with BACS. Um, it's in fact the, uh, when an initial back, uh, direct debit is set up, um, what, what we're looking at is creating a message that will use the request to pay rails to send uh, um, an initial message to that um, payer to say, you have a direct debit that is going to be taken on this day from this account for this amount and then allowing them to have a little bit of interaction with the biller. Um, we understand from, from BACS that a large number of initial direct debits fail because of either insufficient funds or because the, the 
um, payer doesn't recognise the billing institution. So we hope that this, this new message, the Ian, will um, help to alleviate some of those issues and allow a, a conversation to take place between the biller and the payer before the direct debit is taken. Um, Mark is now going to talk about bulk payments. Yeah, so, so this, this, this is very much uh, extending the thinking. So, so obviously the, the initial um, framework that we've put together is very much focused on sending an individual request to, to, to a person to pay. But what we recognise, of course, is that corporate uh, businesses don't work in that way. They, they often have many invoices that come through from a supplier. And so they, they need to be able to pay a number of those all in one go with a single payment. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, developing a message that will allow um, a, a remittance advice in effect to be sent back to the um, to, to, to the biller to notify them of the uh, the individual uh, invoices that are being paid and how much has been paid against them and the payment details so uh, so that that's uh, that one um, charity donation Simon yeah so quickly charity donations we've been working with pennies who are a charity that look at um, adding additional amounts to, to bills that you pay or, or card transactions when you when you buy your coffee or your pizza um, so we're looking at being able to add um, you know round up a bill if you like so when you receive the request you can add an amount to it or you can you can make a donation of five pounds so you can either round it up or, or add an additional amount to, to the request to pay um, so that's that's really exciting again as well and we're also doing some work at looking at third party payments um, and allowing for for so let's say taxes to to be um, identified um, through through request to pay um, and we're working with government bodies to, to look and investigate that. So really exciting stuff that we're doing since the, the um, deployment of request to pay on the 29th of May. Um, back to Mark to do a quick one on return and refund. Yeah, so of course, if, if the original message has been sent through, then um, if you have a problem with the goods that have been delivered or the service has been supplied, then the ability to be able to uh, request a refund uh, or, or return of goods uh, will be really useful uh, and uh, we're, we're going to be looking at uh, evolving the messages to uh, to be able to send those messages back to the bidder as well. Simon. Uh, yep so um, cash obviously cash is a really important element from the, the PSR and the PSF. Um, it's not it's not an easy solution you might think just paying a bill by cash is quite easy but using the request to pay rails is is not as easy as you, you would think so we're working with with other organizations um, to, to try and develop something um, including the post office so that's an ongoing process um, one of which I'm really keen to, to get to the to the bottom of and allow people to to pay to receive a request and then pay it by by cash um, Mark's going to just do re a point of sale. Yeah, in fact, we'll, we'll just summarise on the last two because we're, we're getting a bit tight on time now uh, with, with the, uh, the rest of the agenda. So uh, we've got point of sale and international requests, which are two other features that, uh, that are in the pipeline as well. Uh, and we'll be moving on to those. Um, and so finally, we just wanted to uh, just wrap up this, this sector. By, by just this section by, by just saying uh, please keep in touch um, we uh, we have our website uh, with, with details of, of the offering on there um, and you can also contact us on the uh, we are paid UK um, through, through the we are paid UK website as well if you want to uh, to uh, to contact us that way as well thank you okay I'll hand back to Maha Great, thank you. Um, and you can see that there was a, a, a lot in that very short space of time covered. But but one thing that is clear is that, you know, that there are a number of applications and, and it's an ecosystem. And, you know, I'm pleased to jump straight into the panel um, to, you know, to, to get the perspectives of the various uh, groups within the ecosystem. So I'm going to start with Sean. Um, Sean, uh, you know, you, you've, you've been a, you're known as a, as a user champion. Um, but uh, both in your day job and, and on our advisory council as well. Um, how do you feel that re request to pay can really um, be helpful to people's lives and benefit people's lives and help them actually, um, you know, make money work for them? Thanks, Maha. And Simon and Mark, thanks so much for a brilliant presentation. It's wonderful to see how far you've taken request to pay. So most of us were given the advice, and it's good advice, to set up our bill payments by direct debit the day after our salaries come in and for most of us that works really well but 
in 2019, the number of people on zero hour contracts had already reached over a million people and it was rising all the time. And there are about seven and a half million people who have a basic bank account, which indicates that they're on the lowest of incomes with no access to credit. So the numbers of people for whom there isn't a regular salary coming in or the margin around being able to pay a bill is so tight that a bounce payment is actually significantly harmful. Those numbers are rising all the time. And of course, with COVID, it's making it even worse. People are being made redundant, people are being put on furlough. So all the features that Simon and Mark have talked about, the ability to manage my money and have flexibility, but also have the ability to talk to my bill provider. These are really essential tools in helping manage, particularly for vulnerable customers, but actually in a COVID environment, in a changing work environment, very high numbers of us. And so just thinking through the five features, the fact that I could, for example, just pay now, I can tick that off my list, get it done, out of the way, I've got the money, brilliant, bill done. But maybe I haven't got all the money to pay in one go. So splitting the bill, I can make my payments as my money comes in, which gives me control, but it also means that the bill provider can see that I'm making payments towards the bill. And so communication is working really well. That helps someone manage on, an, on a changing income. And then if I am concerned that maybe this is a scam or I think they've billed me incorrectly, I've been sent an old bill, I can decline it. And that gives me power in a way I've never had before really. But also the bill payer can see that I've declined. So if it's a legitimate request or it's a request in error rather than fraudulent one, they know that I've declined. It's not just sitting uncommunicated. And then what if I'm struggling financially? I can ask for an extension. And again, that is a really clear message to the bill provider, what I'm doing, why I haven't paid on time and that I intend to pay and asking for a specific extension within the bill provider's own terms and conditions. So there's, there's nothing here about um, kind of getting into debt. It's an agreement between the two, between the bill provider and the bill payer. And the last piece is communication. So if I'm really struggling or if I've got questions, if I don't understand the bill, if I'm a bit concerned that I've already paid it and you've sent it to me again, I can communicate all of these different questions. And all of this changes the dynamic between the bill provider and the payer. It means that we can communicate. If I'm struggling, I can tell you. If I need help, I can ask. As a bill provider, it means that I can reconcile quickly. I can understand if my bill hasn't been paid and I can get help to vulnerable customers efficiently. This is a great solution and I really want banks particularly to take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And, you know, um, I'm very passionate about, you know, users being able to benefit from services generally um, within, you know, ac across payments and, um, you know, end user focus is one of our strategic priorities at pay.uk and, and I think that there's no argument with anything you've said there. Um, I, I think I'll move to James Stanley actually just to get a biller's perspective. I'm sure everything that Sean mentioned actually resonates with you um, anyway uh, in terms of the, 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 the user experience but from a biller's perspective can you give us a bit more colour as to how you think request to pay would, would, would benefit? Yeah, absolutely. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'd just probably build on what Sean said, really. Some of the options that come with request to pay, um, where a customer can't pay, they're really difficult conversations under traditional channels for customers to have. But to have that option in, in a messaging channel, we've seen customers who like to engage in messaging channels if they, have, if they are struggling to pay or if they are vulnerable. So th these, um, these options that the customer now has in those channels really, really important. I think it'll be really good for a customer, save customer effort and really help customers have those conversations with, with Villa. So I think they're, they're really, put, really important. Um, I think we'd, we'd see a, a Villa using it to replace the paper bill. So there's obvious benefits from that. We'll get instant feedback on the bill, customer's position in terms of the bill because it's being serviced digitally. We're not waiting for it to deliver in the post. We're not waiting for the customer to contact us. Um, we know if it's a decline, bizarrely enough, a decline message, actually, I think will be a really positive message for a biller because it really gives that biller the uh, opportunity to engage with that customer, which we don't get at the moment if the customer puts the bill in the drawer or something. So I think there's, there's benefits from there. I think going on to the reconciliation thing, I think that's great because we've pre-populated the data, a biller can automatically reconcile the payment, which I, I think everybody who's, who's watching today will know that um, unreconciled payments are a massive problem to billers. Um, 
their effort for the billers, but equally their effort for customers as well, because they'll end up getting chased, they may pay duplicate, duplicate payments. So I think unreconciled payments really helps because we've got that structured data and, and, and reference and save effort both from the customer uh, and the bill and, and maybe their bank as well. So I think really there's huge options for customer engagement that we don't currently have in traditional channels. Um, and it will save on, on the reconciliation. And just you know, just final point really, I think one of the things that we, we look at when we're looking at uh, service propositions is we're looking for the service to be you know, trusted, effortless and personal. And I think that request pay ticks every, all of those three boxes for, for a customer journey. So I think there's, there's real, uh, real use for it in, in the utilities uh, environment. But, uh, but having said that, we need somewhere to send the requests to. Um, and I don't think that's probably, you'll see utilities standing up solutions where people are gonna send all their bills into a utility app. I think we need somebody like the banks or the billers, uh, uh, budgeting apps, really to give us the solutions where we can send the request to see. That's great, thank you, James. And I think that's a nice segue into, um, I, I want to actually, uh, our three panelists kind of coming in and, and and adding further uh, comments there. Moving on to the bank's role in this, James McMorrow, um, representing Bank of America, a global bank, there's been um, questions already on kind of the global nature of this, but, but um, I mean, how, how is this different to other types of um, services out there? You've heard the reconciliation issues and so on for, for billers. How is this different to other services out there um, that, um, that tend to kind of uh, deal with, with bill payments? Yes, Maha. And, and I think you're right, you know, we're definitely experiencing a, a global change in payments at the moment, the advent of open banking and the movement to real time. And, and there are other countries looking and working on request to pay solutions. I'm fortunate to sit on um, BBA request to pay advisory board as well. So I'm working closely with Europe. I think, you know, one of the key differences and, and you know, Simon, Mark have called this out, you know, UK request to pay solution is a messaging service. This means it's payment agnostic. I think when we look globally at some of the other solutions, they're very much focused around one payment scheme. So be that SEPA, uh, US real time. Um, so I think that's really where it does differ. And I think that's an important difference because what it does allow it to do is for clients and you know payers to choose which is the right payment solution for them. It can enable open banking payments, it can enable PayPal, it can enable credit card. It also future-proofs the service as well. So we're seeing so much change happen at the moment. I think the payment future is quite uncertain, quite naturally. Um, so as we see, move in towards new payments architecture, as we see new payment types come up, and also as we see and look more globally, the ability to work cross-border is certainly, I think, you know, something that's you know fairly unique in terms of what the UK Pay UK have looked to do, and I think you know does really broaden out some of the opportunities uh, for UK Request to Pay going forward. I think the other thing that the, you know main difference that I will call out is, and and Sean and you know James talked about this, but but this two way messaging, I certainly feel can be incredibly important. Um, because we all get bills that we don't recognize, be that come through direct debit, be that on our credit card and we go, what was that? So the ability to go back and say, you know, hey, can you tell me a bit more about this? Could you give me the documentation that's referenced, you know, be that a, a loan agreement for a sofa? And it's a great example we use so often. Um, and I think, you know, that really can help uh, resolve any kind of confusion before the payment then is potentially declined because you don't know it or recalled because you're confused by it, which then you know, creates time and effort and work both on the side of the biller and the pair. I think, you know, as we look into can move forward and um, we've heard, you know, so many great points from James and John about how, the benefits, you know, I think we're certainly in a very unusual time. We've certainly seen the adoption of digital services really being promoted through, through COVID. Um, and I think there are some real opportunities uh, to drive some of these benefits that Request Pay does offer. And I think the more parties that are part of the ecosystem and join the ecosystem can only really continue to drive that. And we can see how this develops and, you know, builds in the future. Fantastic. And I think, you know, that point about um, parties joining the ecosystem 
Um, I, think, I think to complete the picture, I mean, the collaboration, I think payments is very much characterised by the collaboration of all participants to actually ensure that the end outcome is achieved. And, um, and to complete the picture, uh, we have, I'll, I'll turn to, um, to Peter from, from Answer Pay. Um, I mean, you know, you've, you've decided to do this and to invest in this. What, what, why, I mean, you've, we've heard some great things already, but from your point of view, why do you think it's worth the investment? Yeah, thank you, Maha. Uh, I think there's three elements that we think about when, when addressing this question. So there's the users, the service providers and the enablers. And the first aspect is, of course, the users of the service who are likely the customers of those who are listening. As addressed by Sean, there's the opportunity to improve financial inclusion, particularly in these difficult times. And I think the point to remember is financial vulnerability is not necessarily a permanent state, but there is a, a point in time element to it. So as a payer, being able to aggregate, prioritise and truly manage your bills in line with when you do have problems is, is massively empowering. Equally, from the biller perspective, cash card and cheque payments are very expensive to process. So the cost reduction aspect of request to pay is very interesting. I think the, the second element regards the service providers who look after these communities, you know, PSPs, banks, bureaus, banks and open banking providers. You know, what incentives do they have to join? I think on the biller side, there's very clearly a direct revenue opportunity in managing the bill, bill requests. But perhaps for, the, for those who serve payers, it's more around the increased customer engagement and the opportunity, the opportunity to increase digital payment volumes. So I'm a big believer that open banking providers who perhaps uh, support personal finance managers today will benefit massively from the opportunity to convert that data traffic into payments traffic. And I think finally, the third element, which is common to both the biller and payer communities, uh, is the need to make a good business case uh, to further justify participation. Uh, and this is where we're, we are uniquely positioned to help. So AnswerPay is built and certified connectivity to the ecosystem in line with the Pay.UK standard, uh, the use of which by these providers lowers their barrier to entry. So you don't have to build it yourself and invest CapEx. You can instead use our services for a quicker and easier route to market. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and actually, I'll move on to Ben uh, quickly. A very similar question to you, but also maybe putting you on the spot a little bit. I mean, we, you know, we tend to hear, um, you know, I guess some of the... Um, the comments around uh, this all relies on uh, financial services providers offering it. I mean, you know, what, what in your view, do you think it's the right time for banks to really um, embrace this and, and get involved now? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Maha. Um, so indeed, I mean, to your first point, I think, um, you know, MasterCard are enrolled as a repository um, already and plan to enroll as a, as a biller application. So similar to AnswerPay, you know, um, we're looking to uh, sort of very much ensure that um, implementation can happen with as little effort as possible from um, our, our customers. Um, and I think that's, you know, sort of true of the wider MasterCard um, view of trying to make payments seamless and secure. Um, so I think in terms of um, kind of why to get involved now, um, I mean, as I'm sure you're aware, um, you know, there's, there's an ever-growing uh, sort of focus on optimising the digital experience, um, both for consumers, but I think also for billing professionals. Um, request to pay, you know, really offers true innovation um, in the way people are able to present their bills, but also to manage um, the payment of these bills as well. Um, so I think that's kind of one key point. I think um, with the digitization at the heart of request to pay, the two sort of way communication channels have been mentioned already um, today, uh, also offers an in innovative way for businesses and consumers um, to interact. And I think, you know, some of the studies have shown that actually any customers who may be struggling um, to keep on top of their bills would prefer to do nothing rather than pick up the phone. So actually that communication channel really kind of supports with those conversations. Um, I think with the kind of ever increasing digital world that we live in, um, there's you know concerns around fraud as well. And I think has been touched upon the, the, the enrollment requirements for request to pay um, sort of add a, a level of security for consumers. Um, who can then kind of rest assured that the entity that they're being um, asked to pay for uh, to pay um, is actually the rightful recipient. Um, and I think right now, um, as we look at the more sort of challenging times financially, um, I mean, request to pay can really help banks, budgeting apps, and many others to offer a really useful tool for customers um, to manage their bills at, sort of in line with their liquidity. So, so being able to see both the bill and the balance um, in the same place. Um, really does kind of give that added level of control. Um, and I think, you know, for, for me, I think that that level of support and engagement um, will, will really sort of be rewarded in the longer term with loyalty for those organisations that do offer these solutions. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, of 
getting involved now, I think we should sort of be clear what we're aspiring to is, is building a brand new ecosystem, really. Um, and I think organisations that have kind of the ability to reach both billers and consumers have a, have a unique opportunity to really drive that forward. Um, and, and, you know, in return, will generate uh, sort of revenue streams across their organisations, really. That's great. Thank you. And I think, you know, we've heard from all of you what I'd like to do, because you've all now heard from each other. I'd like to maybe, um, before we move on to Q&A, to just uh, get kind of key takeaways for you. Just a, a 30 second brief key takeaways uh, from what you've heard so far. So, um, Sean, if I can start with you. Thanks, Maha. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really good conversation to be listening. And I think I'm really struck by, firstly, James, um, as a bill provider. And Anglian Water have been involved with the request to pay development for quite a while now. And, and so what James is telling us is not hypothetical, it's actual, it's real experience of knowing that helping people communicate around whether they want to pay, whether they can pay and whether they need support. That's really powerful for me because we've always known that this is a good solution, but to hear James say, yeah, this is exactly what we need uh, is really reassuring for me. So I think for me, the key takeaway is why are we waiting? Let's get on with it now. Fantastic, thank you. James Stanley. Um, I think there's a couple of quick Quick ones for me. I think the first thing is that don't just think of it as a request to pay, it's a messaging solution. And that's a, that's a real key one. And I, and I would say to anybody who, who is sort of watching, who thinks they've got this because they've got uh, a solution that they think they've got request to pay or it's called pay by link or it's called by pay, something else, compare this solution, this framework to your outcomes and your customer journey in those solutions because they're chalk and cheese really in terms of the customer engagement. Those are a couple of things for me. Thanks, James. Uh, James McQuarrie. Thanks, Michael. I mean, I think, you know, it's very clear, listen to, to Sean James, that, you know, there are some real benefits here for, for the end users. And I think that's really important to recognise. I think listening to what Mark and Simon said with, you know, the future roadmap, uh, the number of initiatives they're looking at and seeing how this could grow and develop, for me, makes it a really exciting prospect. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I'd back up everything that everyone has already said, but I think the, the interesting aspect, we've kind of focused on the B2C use case here, but equally it could be B2B. I think there's an opportunity to integrate with accountancy platforms, for example, to, to, to make that a reality. But also, I mean, we haven't scratched the surface in terms of all the use cases this could serve because it is a messaging layer. So could it serve salary advice uh, or, or advanced schemes, sorry, uh, not just bill payment? Mm. Thank you, Peter. And Ben? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I think everyone's kind of on the same page, really. And I think um, it was really useful for me to hear um, sort of the, the uh, James Stanley talking about how um, the billers could really see the benefit of this. I think at the current times, you know, as Sean has pointed out, it's sort of, um, it's a really important tool that could be used. Um, being agnostic to payment rails really opens up the future. Um, and I think that's kind of really shown through both through with everybody talking, but particularly with Simon and Mark's uh, um, presentation. Um, and I think, you know, at MasterCard, we're really excited. Um, you know, we are kind of bringing those solutions to market because we do see, see this as part of the, um, the kind of digital payments um, future. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, you know, I've heard it's a messaging solution. It's about the customer journey. Um, there are multiple applications, not just C to B, but B to B. Um, you know, the digital, the, the it's it's the the kind of uh, moving into um, a, a new era of payments. You know, being relevant and importantly, Sean's point on why are we waiting? So, um, thank you so much to our panelists. I think it's been a we we don't have a lot of time. We could have gone on and on actually. And the questions, there's so many questions coming in. Uh, we might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll move straight into um, Q&A. And um, let's start with the first question. I might direct this one to um, James Stanley and maybe Simon, if you want to also um, uh, add your response. Why would businesses ever want to offer request to pay to a direct debit customer? James, can I start with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's probably a fair challenge. I think there's lots of benefits for billers in direct debits, um, easy to reconcile, low cost, billers in control. So 
lots of benefits in direct debits. Um, but a couple of things there is that a just because the customer pay, just, uh, pays by direct debit doesn't mean they don't need to communicate with the biller if we think about it as a messaging framework. And also when we think about the changing times that we're in, um, when we got to March and April, we saw our direct debit debit penetration dropped right off because customers were experiencing difficulties. They canceled their direct debits. We need to understand, we want to understand why that is. So, you know, just because they pay by direct debit, for me, why does that exclude them from request to pay and an interaction with the, the biller? I don't think it does. Mm. Thank you. Simon, is there anything you want to add to that or shall we move to the next question? I'll just quickly add something. Um, I don't, when we started request to pay, we had no intention of eating into the direct debit market. But I think as James has rightly said, you know, we've seen a huge difference over the course of 2020. Uh, and, and I think there is a need for request to pay because it offers a different solution. You know, people are happy with DD, then fine. But as I showed with that slide, you know, there are 45% of people that don't pay their, their bills utility bills by direct debit. So um, I think they can complement one another actually and, and Ian demonstrates that perfectly. So I think there's a, there's a space for both if I'm honest. Great, thank you. Let's move on to the next question and I'm going to throw this over to Ben and again Mark if you want to um, add, add your points um, as well. When do we see um, a request to pay being a solution that is readily, uh, that is ready and available? Do you need the major banks slash payment service providers to start to develop in order to help scale up? Ben. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I mean, you know, the framework is live. Um, there are providers available. So from that perspective, you know, we're, we're ready um, uh, to, to offer the service and, and get it moving. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're obviously talking to a number of um, institutions, um, sort of varying sizes um, on both the biller side and the consumer side. And I think there is a huge amount of engagement um, already in the market. Um, I think it's, you know, that there's potentially the, the, the sort of next step is maybe looking at doing some, some testing and piloting so that we can see some of that analysis and, and the, the institutions can actually have that experience for themselves and understand really how it works and where the benefits are. Um, to, to then kind of move forward. Um, and I think, you know, that there are opportunities for, um, the provide service providers within the ecosystem to to offer white label um, opportunities. So actually, you know, there is minimal development, um, and that's certainly something we're looking to do. Um, so you know, I think really the, the short answer is um, we're kind of ready to go. Fantastic, thank you, um, Ben. Uh, Mark, is there anything you want to add to that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say. Um... I mean, I mean, clearly, in order to get reach, uh, we want to get as many people onto this as possible. And, and certainly banks and PSBs are, are a really good way of achieving that. Um, there are other organisations as well that, that I think uh, could, could help us with this objective. So things like comparison websites um, and anybody with a large consumer base, basically, um, will help to extend that reach so that the billers have a means to be able to send the bills um, and we must also remember as well that uh, it's, it's also P2P, so um, there's also uh, that angle to be tapped into as well, or, although obviously the, you know, the primary cases are around sending bills. Um, and um, you know, I think it helps to look around the world uh, where similar services have been implemented already. Uh, Australia is a, a really prime example of that, um, uh, and certainly when I was over there a few years ago, uh, you know, they were advertising on all the buses and, uh, and um, billboards etc as well and really making a big push to to drive up adoption at that time um, and I'd certainly like to see that happening in the UK at some point as well. Thanks Mark. Um, the next two questions I mean they're great questions and, and there's there's a lot coming through um, so I mean I'm probably going to group them together how can request to pay help eradicate the, po uh, the poverty premium in sectors like utilities and telecoms and Sean, I'm going to throw that over to you and perhaps James, if you want to add, James um, Stanley, if you want to add to that. Because the next question is similar in nature. This proposition could really effectively support um, underserved consumers, but a lot of the use cases rely on billers implementing it. Why wouldn't the billers bring request to pay, uh, to pay proposition within their app? So in terms of the eradicate poverty premium in, in sectors like utilities, Sean, can I start with you? 
Sure, thank you. So to answer, you really need to think about why does the poverty premium happen? And it's, I can't spread my payments, so I have to pay something that I can't afford. So my, the cost to me of making that payment actually has a kind of significant burden. Or I can't uh, choose how I pay because I can't afford, for example, the risks of direct debit bouncing. So I have to go for a prepayment meter because it's the only way that I can actually kind of confidently pay or pay at the post office or pay monthly bills, all of which are higher because of the cost of collection and the cost of communicating for the supplier. And finally, because I can't access discounts. So for, again, I can't access a direct debit discount because I can't, I don't have the confidence that I can make those payments. So there's lots of reasons why the poverty premium happens. And so then how does request to pay start to address those? Well, firstly, if I now know that I don't have to make a one-off direct debit payment each month that I have no control over and I'm scared of, but instead I can structure my payments around my money being available, then I might not necessarily immediately get the same kind of discount that a direct debit offers, but in theory, over time, the provider's costs of collection go down. And in theory, they should be passing those costs on. So monitoring the impact of request to pay on the kinds of costs that people who aren't on direct debits are paying, we should, we should you know, be collecting that data and monitoring it. I think there's another angle here. There's also the fact that part of the property premium is around when things go wrong. So, for example, if I um, if my payment is rejected and if I'm not a basic bank account customer, I now get a returned payment fee for any basic bank account customers. Currently, it's the high street banks that are covering that part of the property premium because you can't charge a basic bank account customer for returned payment but anyone who's not on a basic bank account is paying that. So if I can now manage my payment flow so there's no return payment fees, automatically that part of the poverty premium goes down. Ultimately, it's going to be about utility providers, telecoms providers, passing on the cost savings as cost savings occur. And that's something that we'll need to monitor. Uh, James, did you want to add? Um, the only other maybe thing that uh, I'd add on to that is because we're talking about request to pay being a messaging framework, the customers may well be able to access um, discounted tariffs or, 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 or other support schemes, you know, through that channel that they, they really feel uncomfortable about picking up the phone and saying, I can't pay my bill. Um, and that's, a you know, and again, that's where I think the benefits of messaging really comes in is because it's, it's almost an anonymous conversation, if you like, and it, 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 the conversation is dealt with at a pace that the customer likes and the customer can feel comfortable with using messaging as opposed to where it probably could be slightly embarrassing it, you know, or on the phone and, and they maybe don't want to do it. So I, I think that's the other way that it can help customers address that um, because it, it, it is that, uh, that, more, that better channel for them to, to deal with those problems. Okay, thank you. Um, We'll go to the next question, um, and maybe um, Peter, I can ask you to, to start um, with that and, and others, uh, maybe James McFarrow or, or Ben. How does um, a customer get a full view of any in-progress requests without having to go to multiple sites or providers? Yeah, and this is one of the, the, the big plus points for, for um, request to pay, is that effectively the consumer is actually ingesting all of those requests into their application. That's an application they've chose, uh, chosen that, that has the payment methods that, that they want to use and they've pulled all of those requests into that application. So therefore all of those um, uh, requests are all aggregated and visible to them so they can choose uh, you know what's the due date on one, what's the, what's the amount that's due on the other one and prioritize accordingly which ones they want to pay at which point in time and, and, and that's why it's so, so massively empowering. Thanks, and I'll, I'll stay with you and maybe Ben can also um, uh, come in on this question. Can we see the international request to pay working given the, that the UK's approach, so this is a great question, the UK's approach so far has been unique versus request to pay approaches in um, uh, European and, and other geographies? Yeah, and, and it is a great question. And I think you're right, there's, there's different standards for almost for each national market and, and regional markets as well that are developing. And what you tend to see is that where there's a, an instant payment network, there'll be an overlay request to pay service attached to it in, in some way, shape or form. Um, I, I can absolutely see this working internationally. Uh, my background's open banking. And when you've come from that world where, you know, you have to try and connect with 4,000 banks and each one's unique, people manage to do it. 
I think here, you know, just across UK and Europe, there's two standards. So it's been able to integrate and abstract the complexity across two standards, not a problem. Fantastic. Simon or Mark, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, yes, yes, thanks. In terms of, I mean, we talk about interoperability all the time, don't we? I just wanted to say that um, actually within the messaging standards that we've already create, created, there is um, space for, um, to answer a few questions, I say 20022, so it's, it's uh, future-proof from that perspective. Um, but there is also the ability to carry um, BIC and IBAN, so we've, we've internationally proofed it as well. Um, and as James said in his presentation earlier on, we're, we're, it's totally different from anything else that is out there in, in the rest of the world. Um, and because of, of the nature of it, it's a messaging service. If you start thinking of it like SWIFT, we can, um, we can adapt those standards um, to fit whatever payment method you want to, to incorporate into it. So we're, we are saying in the UK that um, this is the op option that you should take in, in your request to pay development because it gives you that international development capability as well because we've already incorporated that into it. That's great. Thanks, Simon. Um, the next question is another great one. Many governments will look to support nascent payment solutions, especially when it, um, when it provides support to our most vulnerable communities. Will the UK government, and I hope there's, um, we've got representatives from UK government actually listening to this, will the UK government look to do the same with request to pay? Um, I don't know who can answer this from our panelists. I'm thinking, Simon, do you want to start with that? Because I know that we may have um, we, we, you know, we, we may have a view to give you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it's great that we've got people from the government on, on the, uh, the webinar. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, we, we work closely with government. We even have um, um, people from the government on our advisory group. So we are closely working hand in glove with them, trying to work on solutions that they could utilise with um, for request to pay. Um, I think request to pay could work right across the board. I think an interesting one that we're, we're sort of exploring is, you know, the, the, the um, license fee, the road tax, if you like, um, and utilising request to pay to, to, for consumers to pay their, their um, road tax in respect of receiving a request to pay, which is linked to their, um, to their license plate. So we would need some form of proxy identification to do that. But um, it's exciting. Yeah, you know, there, that's just one example. Your fishing license could be another one. Um, but ultimately, the, 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 the real goal would be for HMRC to take it up um, in respect of, of the taxes that are, are um, claimed in, in March and April time. The use of request to pay from that perspective would be fantastic. And because request to pay allows um, the biller to put the reference data in that they need to reconcile that, um, a lot of issues would then go away for, for HMRC in respect of once the payment is received, the reconcil reconciliation is, is simple and easy uh, and you wouldn't have things like my tax bill um, or VAT or, or whatever, which makes it in incredibly difficult. So we are working very closely with government and, and I think there are some exciting times ahead in respect of that. And I want to bring in Sean on this one. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have a view at least on this. So Sean, do, do you mind? Absolutely. So I think Simon's given some really good examples of how government can be an end user of request to pay. But I think there's also a role for government to make sure that request to pay is adopted across the payments industry. Now, we know that there's a lot of regulatory obligations on all parts of the payments industry and financial services provider and with COVID but also with transformation across the industry capacity is often at a maximum and boards and innovation boards within banks and other providers have difficult decisions to make and sometimes they find it really helpful to have a steer from government about what government would like them to do in terms of prioritising and we know that request to pay can help solve very significant financial difficulties for people in vulnerable circumstances and COVID is going to increase that over the next mm. year or so and we're, we're hitting recession so more and more people are going to struggle to pay bills in full on time and being able to reduce the costs to providers of those circumstances happening again and again and again has got to be a really important innovation and a big step forward in reducing costs so we would like from the consumer voice sector 
uh, government to give a very clear steer, whether that's through legislation or whether that's through guidance to the industry that requests to pay really should be on their priority list. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And um, like I said, I hope uh, we do have representatives on the call from um, from government. We'll move on, but perhaps we'll do two more questions actually before we wrap up and, and we're, we're doing well for time, although questions still <laughs> seem to come in. Um, what, uh, maybe Mark, if I could bring you in on this one, what commitments do, do we have from banks to include this in their banking app? That's a really good question. Uh, and we've obviously been talking uh, to, to all of the banks as we've been going through this process. Um, but as uh, some of you will know this more than others, uh, probably uh, it is that the banks uh, work very much on budget cycles and so they have to basically put forward their case to uh, secure the funding uh, for the following financial year then to to go and run their projects uh, and so we're at that stage at the moment where where, where banks have put in their um, their bid if you like uh, to run these projects uh, starting next year uh, some slightly earlier um, but we're not going to see them coming through uh, for a little while yet um, and, and so we, you know, we're continuing to search through activities like this, et cetera, to uh, stimulate the market to, uh, to adopt the framework. Um, and I think as well, it's worthwhile looking forward as well. Uh, Request to Pay is part of the, um, the new payment architecture program, which is currently running within uh, Pay.UK. Uh, and we're going to continue to be working on uh, the evolution of, of Request to Pay in terms as to how it will interact with the, the rest of the payment architecture, uh, whilst keeping in mind, of course, the request to pay is payment agnostic and so it supports um, all, all, all forms of uh, payment uh, service. So, um, so, so that, that's, that's where we are in terms of commitment from the banks um, uh, and we'll continue to work on that. Great, and we'll move on to um, the last question. Um, maybe I can uh, I'll throw this over to Ben. How does the cost of request to pay compare to something like direct debit per transaction processing cost? It's a very specific question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, what, what we're looking at here is a sort of a brand new market. So ultimately, um, we're in a competitive space and I think it will it will be different. Um, I mean, you know, we obviously have a view at Mascot. I don't know what other... other um, companies who are offering services will be charging. Um, I think also there's a number of stages along, along the journey, um, which, which some um, enrolled participants will be offering and they, and they, you know, may well make those comparables to direct debit. They may decide to do something different. You know, ultimately um, we don't have a kind of a specific cost because it's a competitive market and everyone will have their own offering. Um, and there'll be different value, value adds, you know, for each of the different offerings that come to market, I'm sure. Great, thank you. And thank you all. Um, thank, thank you all for, for the time and your thoughts and, and, um, and participating in this. Um, so a massive thank you to our panellists, uh, but obviously a huge thank you to everybody who's um, also dialed in um, to the call. And I, I, we certainly hope you have found this uh, useful. Um, so we haven't been able to get through all of the, um, all of the questions. There's, there's quite a lot there. But what we want to try and do is actually take them all and find a way in which we can share the answers with you, um, knowing that, uh, you know, this is a topic that is, is sparking quite a lot of conversation, which is exactly what, what, um, what we were hoping for and, and what we wanted to do. So um, we'll come back to you. Um, we'll let you know how we, we, we can come back to you with, uh, with responding to these questions one way or the other. Um, uh, you will also receive a thank you email from us. And in the thank you email, um, You'll receive, you'll, um, uh, we'll be inviting attendees to, to put down their details so we can, with your permission, obviously, um, share your information with, uh, with, with others. So um, in, that, in that thank you email, you'll be able to do that. Um, obviously, if you don't get the thank you email, uh, you can write to us at inquiries at wearepay.uk and request that we, um, that we add your, your contact details and, and share, share those around. So we hope that, um, you know, you're leaving this webinar with, uh, with more information about request to pay um, and its potential to, uh, to really kind of, you know, add value and, and transform, transform the customer experience and, and improve reconciliation and, and all the, the, the good things that our panelists spoke to you about. Um, you can keep up to date with everything request to pay um, uh, and everything else indeed that's happening with, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what we're doing at pay.uk. 
um, by you know, going to our website or following us on Twitter um, and so on the usual channels. But for now, um, I wish you all um, a wonderful day and um, hope to see you all again online perhaps uh, very soon. Thanks very much.